You thought I would take months to make this, didn't you? Hey guys, it's Soralum1, and welcome to my final analysis in this run of analysis I've been doing. This is the Tokyo Game Show Big Hero 6 trailer analysis. Alright, so Square released a short version and a long version of these trailers. The surprise is they basically released two completely different trailers. The short version is like its own trailer with a preview of the long one at the end. So technically I will be analyzing two trailers in this video. I'll flip between the two to have everything fit together as smoothly as possible. You know the drill, I'm gonna point out the obvious, the not so obvious, and everything in between. So let's get started. And we begin with the chessboard scene again, our first time seeing it in a long time. This time they're showing us the end of the chess game. Right away you'll notice that Ericus is getting destroyed in this game, with a lot of Xehanort's pieces surrounding his final one, and Xehanort calls checkmate. Since this chess game is highly likely to be symbolic and parallel to the actual final battle in Kingdom Hearts 3, every piece here means something. So the one white piece is clearly Sora, signaling the end of the final battle and that he will be the last one left standing. You can see all the other pieces in the back on his side are taken out, probably meaning they were defeated in the fight. None of them are shown enough to really get a feel on who is who, but we get the picture. So much for my friends and my power. As for Xehanort's pieces, the way I think each character is represented is as follows. Zigbar because it's similar to his weapon. Young Xehanort is in Hourglass because Hourglasses in Time are a big theme in his battles and his Keyblade. Luxor because rolling the dice and luck is all part of his game. Saix because this shape looks like the tip of his Claymore. Vanitas because that symbol is on the keychain of his Keyblade. Marluxia because flower petals are right up his alley. Larkseen because these sharp points can represent her knives. Ansem because this head is similar to his guardian. Xemnas because Xemnas wields two blades and it being right next to Ansem as well makes this plausible. And up here it's not seen at any point in the trailer and I think that's on purpose, but I believe this top piece would be Master Xehanort. I wonder what symbol they'd give him. Something to note about the pieces though, in 2015 we saw clips of them earlier in the game and there were 100% duplicate pieces in the game, so the entire chess game might not be gospel for foreshadowing unless it's telling the defeats of the villains in previous games as well, but I'm very sure that this scene in particular with the pieces surrounding Sora has a very deliberate meaning. While Xehanort says checkmate, he makes a move and moves another piece in front of Sora. This symbol looks most similar to the keychain on Terra's Ends of the Earth Keyblade, so this piece is supposed to represent Terra. I wonder what Terra specifically will be doing in the final fight to make it seem like the final move to put Sora in checkmate. Interesting to note, Ericus also had this same piece on his side earlier in the game in a previous trailer, so that could be signifying Terra's fall. After this, Xehanort is boasting, talking about how it's just like the legend where darkness prevails even in their little game of chess. Let's take a moment to appreciate the graphical upgrades since 2015. The lighting is even more well done, Xehanort's skin has become noticeably darker, and with a better look at their outfits, we can see both characters have this sigil, the X, on their chest. That is pretty normal for any Keyblade wielder who comes from the Land of Departure, though. So Xehanort is out here acting like the game is over, but hmm. Ericus grabs his piece and says he still has a move. Now this gets me so hyped, no, not because I'm some kind of chess enthusiast, but because of the implication. It's implying that during the final battle, Sora is going to be surrounded and have it seem like everything's all over, being on his last leg like the checkmate implies, and then Sora's going to pull something off to turn it all around. What it'll be, we'll have to see when we get there because the scene cuts right after that. But wow, that is one amazing opening scene to this trailer, isn't it? Well, now let's move on to some basic Disney World stuff. We get a scene on the bridge with Sora, Donald, and Goofy spotting some Heartless, new Heartless by the way, Gogo -Go comes crashing down immediately. Go -Go, and Hero and Baymax come to see if she's okay. I believe this scene is Sora, Donald, and Goofy first landing in the world. Big Hero 6 is already a superhero team, so it makes sense for them to have already been fighting Heartless by the time we arrive. Sora is showing off the Big Hero 6 Keyblade and it has lots of references on it, but I really like how it has both faces from Hero's original bot fights on it. Baymax introduces himself to Sora, and Gogo -Go is still on the floor! Baymax! I thought your number one concern was people's health, but here he'd rather introduce himself? Oh, how the mighty have fallen. 
Hiro introduces himself and asks for help fighting against the Heartless. Obviously, we know Sora's answer. What's your offer? Well, in this fight, we see Sora activate the Keyblade transformation for the new Keyblade, Nano Arms. So, you already know this is all about the nanobots from the movie. We can also see Baymax immediately join the party and. Sora, what is this MP bar? Are you kidding me right now? Is this what endgame stats look like? Sora's form in this one is green again, and that probably means speed form. Interesting choice considering what we'll see from this form and how this transformation works later. Because of the better angle, we can see a new design on his shorts for the form too. The transformation by default looks mostly like the regular Keyblade, just with the end completely becoming nanobots ready to go into any formation. Sora goes up to fight... Wait, is this the Rock Troll? Yeah, so it looks like in Big Hero 6 they will redesign some enemies to fit the theme of the world, kind of like how they did for some worlds in past Kingdom Hearts games. The Rock Troll was originally shown off as a sort of boss fight, but seeing it return again and again again later, makes it seem like some Heartless that first appear as mini-bosses can appear as just regular enemies later in the story. Okay, maybe not regular enemy, holy health bar. Recurring boss battle, maybe? We'll just call this one the Not Rock Troll from now on. Oh, and by the way, nice slight update to the HP bar. So the interesting thing I notice about this Nano Arms Keyblade transformation is it emulates attacks from old Keyblade transformations and puts it all into one. Oh god, do I hope this is an endgame world, because otherwise this would be really OP. I think it does it randomly though, so maybe you won't always get to deliberately choose which past Keyblade transformation attack you're using. For this combo, we see him start off with a twin yo-yos attack, and then the nano arm switch to an attack from Hyper Hammer. Even the ground pound effect is different, and now looks all squared out to represent the nano arms. That's cool. Finally, Sora goes into a finisher where the nanobots make a giant fist for him to shoot at the enemy. I think that this finisher is not stolen from a past transformation and is unique to Nano Arms. I mean, it has to have some identity somehow. I also think that because when Hero is first demonstrating microbots, he uses a very similar looking hand as an example, and shooting off a fist is one of Baymax's well known moves, so it makes sense for this to be a Big Hero 6 exclusive move. Looking closely, the pieces don't look like the actual nanobots, nanobots, microbots, I'm probably going to switch between the two names by the way. But anyways, these are instead cube shapes instead of the old microbot shape. I don't think this means anything, I just think the microbots original shape would be way too graphically intensive for these attacks and the game would have to lag, so they changed it to something simpler like cubes. The boss gets staggered and falls from Sora's finisher here, which just reinforces Sora needs finishers to stagger this boss. Sora has a finish command available during this fight with Nano Arms, so it's possible that this will not have a level 2 transformation. Why would it need one anyway? And here we can see Sora use the finish command for Nano Arms, in which he goes up into a ball and the microbots damage everything around him. Pretty flashy and cool. Next we get a quick flash of action sequences from this world, showing off a little action for each Big Hero 6 member. They all get attacked by these cube things, which honestly don't look like the nanobots from the movie. You could easily mistake them for it, but this looks like the bugs from Kingdom Hearts Recoded. Coded is relevant? They appear in both red and green, and in Recoded the green ones were used for platforming and the red ones were the normal ones, but it looks like in this world they all attack you no matter what the color is. There's no word on who's controlling this, but I think we all have a clue. We see a quick shot of Hero typing something in his home lab garage thingy. You can tell because the design in the back is the same one from the movie. He's speaking to Sora from home, but the crew is out in the city. Oh wow, real cute goggles you got on there, Sora. And they are told to protect someone. Interesting how Sora is using the Toy Story Keyblade suddenly. At various points in this trailer, in non-Toy Story sequences, Sora will have the Toy Story Keyblade equipped. Just fun little note. All these action scenes have been nighttime scenes, and this is the third world we've seen both night and daytime scenes for now. Let's look at the start of the extended trailer now. <laughs> oh look, it's the guy who's not the rock troll. <laughs> this is a new music track playing for the Big Hero 6 world, and it reminds me a lot of this one track from the grid in Dream Drop Distance. <laughs> Keyblade Hero 3. 
Ha, ah, cute name. Funny, it also abbreviates to <gasps> KH3. Back to gameplay, we get to see some wall running. Notice how Sora veers very slightly to the left and then a bit to the right. They may have touched up on the wall running if this isn't just cosmetic. In the old demo, when you tried to move left or right even slightly, Sora would full on run to the side. In this footage, he more naturally turns. I don't know which way I prefer though, although this looks smoother, I feel like the old way may give you more direct control of where you're going. Sora attacks these little laser looking camera things, and if you look very closely, you can see that they are heartless. The first slash he's doing is something we haven't really seen since 2015 in the Jump Festa trailer, but it's back. Wow, you can see the reflection of the city here, what is this detail? In our next gameplay sequence, it's a fight on top of a building. Oh look, it's the guy who's not that heartless from Olympus. Wow, and he has way more health than he ever did in Olympus. This really is the end. Hmm, wonder why they redesigned all these Olympus Heartless, but let the Soldier rock his original design? Wow, Soldier is so iconic at this point that he gets special treatment. What a diva. Sora uses a Nano Arms combo. The first hit, you really only get to see a glimpse of it, but it looks like it takes from twin yo-yos once again. But for some reason, the next two attacks are just normal Keyblade swipes. How is this possible? Why is it that when he was attacking before, he always got variations, but now he gets regular slashes? Is there some way to control this? But of course, you can see after these two hits, good old Nano Arms goes back to normal and steals a move from the Drill Punch transformation. Next, Sora teams up with Baymax. Who didn't see this coming? Well, this of course is the limit, I guess you can call it for these two. Limits are situation commands that appear when the party member decides they're ready to team up. This is called Intercept Jet. Sora's options on his commands for this limit are Attack, Shoot, Air Dodge, and Cancel. What we see on here is where they split up and converge would be the Attack, I guess? Next, Sora activates the finish for this, and they kinda just slowly charge forward and do very little damage to the enemies? Is that really a finisher? Talk about lukewarm. I think they cut the beginning of it a bit based on the HP bars and are only showing the finish wrapping up. Very weird how this looks in the trailer, I've never seen a finish for this type of limit that's not fully cinematic, so what they could have done is they could have made a very sneaky cut after the finish activated and then showed a normal attack here afterwards. I think that might be what it is. Moving on, we get more footage of Intercept Jet, except this time it's not a limit and more like a forced Intercept Jet state for the sake of the story. Amazing, at the bottom, you can see traffic moving in real time. Just how much work did they put into this world? Sora and Baymax are chasing some kind of boss that's leaving behind bug blocks as obstacles for them. Oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. This boss has the same color scheme as the dark Baymax from the old reveal artwork in 2015. They're chasing the old Baymax right now. Although in that art, he has nanobots coming out of him and not bug blocks. Interesting update. In fact, this artwork in itself looks like it's entirely the concept for this Intercept Jet gameplay that we're now seeing come to life. Anyways, the blocks connect and make lines that I guess you can't fly into or you'll take damage. Oh, and now they show off what the shoot command for Intercept Jet actually looks like. If we look at the commands, you'll see how the cancel option that was at the bottom before has been replaced with something called Care Spray. That is probably an option to heal yourself during this boss since Sora doesn't have any of his regular commands available. Next, we're going to analyze the nighttime gameplay scene. In our first scene, Sora runs forward and there's a green target on this Neo Shadow. They haven't shown this in an actual trailer until now, but this green circle is just a signal that you can attack this enemy to unlock a situation command for an attraction flow. Think like reality shifts markers from Dream Drop Distance. We also get this triangle command over the tire of a car, and it translates to Cover Slide. Sora never uses it in this trailer, but it could potentially be the same command as this one from the earlier E3 trailers, where Sora has the option to use Slide Shot while going to the destination. We cut to the next clip, and real quick, we can now see the attack from these Laser Heartless thing, and they... Fire lasers, who would have guessed? Sora uses a thunder on them, and it looks like it stuns them all. Even the Neo Shadow, which is a normal thing that happened in 0.2, but maybe what they were trying to show in the clip is that since these Heartless seem to be electronic, using thunder on them would put them in that shocked state more easily? Then again, they could just be trying to show something flashy. In our next clip, Sora dodge rolls to the side and then shows us this shot lock called Cubic Train. 
Hey, wait a minute, I know this. This shot lock was shown off in 2015, but that was for a different Keyblade. Back then it was just labeled as Shoot Flow. I don't know if they changed it and this is now Big Hero 6 Keyblade shot lock, or if this is stealing from the Star Keyblade. As far as I remember from the demo, shot locks were tied to the Keyblade you were using, so this really is strange. In our next clip, it looks like the party is in a boss battle and they seem to be on some kind of rooftop or something. Bug blocks are blocking the sky to keep them trapped in the area. There's a giant red hand made of bug blocks and it shoots down at Sora. Sora guards it perfectly like the monster he is, and you see that when he guards, he has the option to retaliate with Revenge Dive. This must be his counter move. We never get to see exactly what the boss battle here actually is, if there is one, all we see is blocks attacking. In the next scene, we get to see a mini game. Baymax flies off into who knows where at the beginning, and Sora gets about 100 data points for every ring he touches. There's this endpoint indicator that lets you know how far away you are from something, I guess how far away you are from a goal. If I had to guess, this minigame is probably something where Hero asks Sora to collect data so he can upgrade Baymax or your nanobots or something. That is, if it has anything to do with the story. There's an autosave in the corner, so this is probably required to progress the story. While sliding, Sora has a new option to switch lanes, which he shows off in the trailer. And we end it with a simple diving sequence. The diving and sliding sequences are out of order based on the timer. There's also this thing on the rooftop here that's glowing in the same fashion that the ring's glowing. Maybe you get more points by going up to this and touching it? Okay, let's take a break from gameplay for a bit. Ice cream, hmm. Alright, so obvious Big Hero 6 spoilers, but when Hero mentions his brother, he's talking about his brother Tadashi, who died at the beginning of the movie. He wanted to help people, so he invented Baymax to take care of people's health concerns. When Hero says that he's still here, it could be a slight nod to the line Baymax would repeatedly tell Hero at several points in the movie. Tadashi is here. No, he's not here. Tadashi is here. So now it looks like Hiro is saying that in a way himself. Sora is bonding with them over this and then suddenly he transforms into Roxas and sees Hainer, Pence, and Olette in their Kingdom Hearts 2 outfits eating sea salt ice cream. This is Roxas inside of Sora remembering something. It has happened before in a different way with Sora shedding a tear after meeting them in Kingdom Hearts 2. Next, we see Riku letting Mickey know that he can face the darkness now while in the realm of darkness. Nice. Mickey says it's because he found the strength to protect what matters. This is a quote of Riku's from Birth by Sleep. He told Terra that he wants the strength to protect what matters, and that's what made Terra want to perform the Keyblade inheritance on Riku in the first place. Riku's model looks a little bit different now, his hair seems a bit more smooth, and you could even say that it looks more like his old hairstyle from before he got this new outfit. This might be before he makes a trip to the barber shop, and if it's not just a weird angle on the lighting, it looks like they may have changed his buttons to be black. Sora gets a call in the gummy ship, but... Aw oh man, it's just the Enzo. <laughs> it did look like in the last trailer, Sora saw Riku and Mickey return from the Realm of Darkness earlier in the story, so I don't think he's worried about Riku's well-being, probably was just excited to hear from Riku. But then again, Donald and Goofy's reactions make it seem like they really needed a call from Riku. Maybe Riku and Mickey go to the Realm of Darkness or some other dangerous place twice for some reason. Looks like this mobile FaceTime device is going to be a recurring thing in the story, with Ianzo being our most frequent caller. And of course, Sup Jiminy. Oh my god, Tangled looks like it's gotten another graphical lighting upgrade, mainly looking at the way the sun shines down on Sora. Rapunzel sees the fluffy thing and it turns out to be those heartless we've known for a while now. Her reaction to this makes me think it's one of the first scenes that plays in this world, if not the very first. It makes sense for Rapunzel not to know whether or not there's been a heartless problem because she's tasting freedom for the first time herself after being locked up in a tower for her whole life. We have another Tangled scene where we get a closer look at these Marluxia nobodies and Ew, what is this squishiness? And anyway, Sora was going to ask Flynn and Rapunzel to do something, nobody knows what it was, but Flynn takes it as a cue to book it. Hey man, you're both party members, act like it. In our one and only Toy Story scene, we got Sora and the gang running into young Xehanort again. Ooh, nice Square Enix logo in the back of the fake game. $59, wow, that's... completely normal for modern video games. Xehanort says he has more to observe, so he can't leave yet. 
That line makes me think that this scene takes place after a boss battle or something, and he shows up to say that he's not done. Either way, Sora just accomplished something right before this scene. In our one and only Monsters Inc. scene, Sora and his party thought that they were leaving until Randall showed up. Randall was revealed at the Kingdom Hearts Orchestra earlier this year in a private trailer, but this is his first publicly available appearance. This does make it so that Vanitas is not the sole villain of this Monsters Inc. original storyline. <laughs> oh look, there's our Davy Jones reveal. It looks like in this scene he caught Jack trying to sneak up on him and Jack just tries to play it off. Maybe he was sneaking up on him to try and steal the chest that contains his heart or something? Remember, I don't really know the storyline for these movies well, so I don't know if that's even possible in this scene, but the box does seem to be the goal of the world. Also, weather change, it's raining now. Here's a heartwarming little scene of Sora letting Anna know that she can bring Elsa back. Don't know why they're one on one. Where is everyone? Oh, okay. On Destiny Island, Sora picks up the Master Keeper. Yes, I love it that it looks like Sora goes back to Destiny Islands in the middle or even the end of the story. This scene has been here since the very first trailer for Kingdom Hearts 3. What an upgrade. And wow, it's actually a real scene in the game, not a conceptual one. Okay, let's talk about this Keyblade. How did it get here? Well, at the very end of Kingdom Hearts 0.2, Aqua is laying on the Destiny Islands that was in the Realm of Darkness during Kingdom Hearts 1. Sora successfully restored the worlds right at this point, so Destiny Islands was moving from the Realm of Darkness back to the Realm of Light in real time while Aqua was laying on this beach. But for some reason, she can't be restored along with the world, so she falls through the floor into the Dark Abyss. She's not holding her Keyblade in this scene though, so the Keyblade manages to stay on the world and move to the Realm of Light with it, but Aqua does not. Note, we never see Aqua use this Keyblade again after this scene, so this could be plausible. The only concern I have with this idea is this is happening during the end events of Kingdom Hearts 1, so why would they not have found Aqua's Keyblade on the beach earlier and why are they just now finding it in Kingdom Hearts 3? So an alternative to this could be something like Kairi's bottle message that she sends to Sora that ends up in the Realm of Darkness. Maybe at some point we haven't seen yet, Aqua willfully sends her Keyblade away across the shores or something. Oh boy, you know the drill. Last time Goofy did that, Sora let his Kingdom Key open the path to Olympus. So we're probably going to do the same thing again here. I wonder where this Keyblade will take him. There's a few options for that question. It is the Master Keeper, so this Keyblade is what was used to lock the Land of Departure and turn it into Castle Oblivion. So maybe it'll take him back to that world. That can technically also be considered the Keyblade leading them to Ventus. My only other guess is it will lead Sora to the one who actually wields this Keyblade, which would be the Dark Aqua in the Realm of Darkness. Since it looks like she might have won the battle against Riku and the King, the Keyblade could lead Sora to her and then we get a proper boss battle against her. Next, we see Luxord looking at the pirate ship in the distance. He says nobody knows what's in the chest he's looking for, which implies that none of the Xehanorts know what's in the black box from the Master. Well, I have a suspicion that Master Xehanort may know, but to Luxord's knowledge at least, nobody knows. I have no idea who Luxord is talking to, maybe Davy Jones himself since it looks like it's in the same rainy scene. In the Frozen world, it looks like Lark's scene and the party are having a conversation, but all of space-time has frozen <laughs> so they can carry this out privately. Sora says it's not like they have their 13 darknesses ready, and then Larkseen says they do. She could very well be telling the truth here, and probably is, but there's a couple of things that seem confusing. We'll talk more about Xehanort's a little bit later, but Sora Donald and Goofy's reactions to this does kind of make it seem like there's a chance that something's not adding up here. Alright, so it's official now. It looks like the Hainer, Pence, and Olette crew's whole storyline in this game will be trying to remember who Roxas was and to bring him back. We see a comparison of the digital world photo and the real world photo. This photo was given to Sora by Riku in Kingdom Hearts 2. Sora did use this photo to find his way in Kingdom Hearts 2, but I don't think he really took the time to show them in that game what was in the photo. So I guess this has to all come full circle now in Kingdom Hearts 3. They're outside of the mansion preparing to enter the digital Twilight Town. Let's go back to gameplay. First, we're gonna look at some gummy ships. They show off a bunch of the preset gummy ships you'll get to use in the game it looks like. And the team behind a game called Einhander is helping with the gummy ships in Kingdom Hearts 3. 
and this ship looks like a callback to a ship from their game. This one looks like it came right out of Wreck-It Ralph's Sugar Rush, Moogle of course, uh, right, moving on. Looking at the updated Gummy Ship gameplay, there is a radar and a heartless symbol on the screen at all times. I don't know what the other symbols are on the radar, maybe some kind of bonus objective or items. In the past, they described that the Gummy Ship will have moments where it will be like a free roaming mode, which is what I think this is right now. You select an area, you get to free roam, and then when you go to the Heartless symbol, it will put you in a battle that opens the path to the world. Notice how during the boss here, there's no radar anymore, and now there's a score, timer, and Heartless count in the top left. I think that this is what it looks like when you arrive at the Heartless symbol. On the right of the screen, the Gummy has HP, boost, and a weapon slot. And in this trailer, we see three different weapon symbols. After it uses a weapon, it looks like you'll have to wait for this pink bar to refill so that you can use it again. And then there's this level meter in the top right that ranges from 10 to 16. I don't know what it's specifically for. The environment appears to be destructible too. Neat. In the final clip where they show what another Heartless area looks like, instead of the ship fighting against one specific boss enemy, there's this whole fortress where they already killed up to 27 Heartless. So it may not be a single boss for the Heartless mission every time. Back to the other trailer, we go from gummy ships to pirate ships. This time there's a storm and it looks like this is a Kraken boss battle. There's some red glowing dot in this shot and I think it's coming from the other enemy ship. Although I said Kraken boss battle, we never see the party actually attack the Kraken, but they do attack this enemy ship. It also looks like there's another ship somewhere that you have to protect. Oh, and in the scene right before this, you can see the Kraken holding that ship that we have to protect. In the next scene, they show a cool looking set piece where your ship gets flung up and then comes crashing down. And it looks like you can somewhat aim where you're gonna land. And this does do damage to other ships. Wow, look at the water effects on the ship, that's awesome. The enemy ship, if you look closely, has a glowing dark orb on it. Usually we've only seen them green and red, so I wonder what this one means. Back on land, Sora does a physical combo in this beautiful waterfall area. You know what's cool about this combo? Finally, we see Sora do a normal default combo again, where he does two normal hits into a finisher. That negative combo setup for a year straight was starting to worry some people. This is more evidence pointing to a traditional Kingdom Hearts ability combo system, which Nomura has talked about in the past, but you know these trailers can get people wary sometimes. And Luxord is the organization member for this world, so the gambler nobodies make their return. It cuts to Sora showing us the finisher for Storm Flag, and it has a nice Kraken reference. Oh no, what are the water cores doing here? Can't believe he can dish out water attacks, but he can't take them. Next, we go back to Olympus. Wow, that makes it so every single confirmed world in the game so far makes an appearance in these two trailers. Except Mysterious Tower, I guess, if you want to count that as its own world. We see a Goofy Sledding minigame, but this time it's called Trinity Sled instead of Goofy Curling. It appears to be a minigame where you collect these little truffle cupcake sweet looking heartless for a high score. There's a time limit to it as well. I believe these little Heartless are going to be a new minigame Heartless for Kingdom Hearts 3 spread across the worlds. Think of it like the Mushrooms and the Mushroom 13 Heartless where the objective is not to fight but to complete some minigame. Also there's a treasure chest on this ledge here where they slide down. Why is that relevant? Well because it tells us that this is a real area in the world that you can explore and not just an area exclusive for the sledding minigame. The other difference is you can't jump during this minigame and this option says cancel instead. As they slide forward a bit, if you look closely at the ground, there's a boost pad again, but this time it's orange instead of blue. In another minigame in the Tangled World, we see Sora taking a selfie with the Heartless. Never thought I'd say that in one of my videos. It's not just a simple photo, this is something again that you have to time correctly for a high score. It looks like you'll get more points for this photo based on capturing the animals that are sitting on the Heartless. I guess this Heartless also doubles as a Disney princess now. The new seven hearts. Looks like you have to get seven perfect photos, maybe seven different angles or seven different locations where this Heartless is located for the photo shoot. This looks like the amount of film Sora has, and Sora has used 14 out of 100 already. Or it's not that complicated and the game will only save your last 100 photos, which is very reasonable. There's a button to switch the camera view and that may also double as the game's first person mode. And finally in the top left here there's a little face icon and this might be a toggle that lets you change Sora's facial expression during the selfie so he doesn't always have to be smiling. 
Alright, enough fooling around, let's get to some big boy stuff. In Frozen, there's this really cool wolf boss battle that Sora's fighting against, it's probably a Heartless. Look carefully and you'll see it actually has no legs and is a floating torso. It kinda reminds me of this old thing from Tekken Tag Tournament. Sora attacks him with Hyper Hammer. Marshmallow has also joined the party. Surprising, but also not surprising because Nomura has said this would happen back in the E3 days. The thing about Marshmallow joining your party though makes me think that Elsa at some point before this fight may come to her senses and that's when she'll allow Marshmallow to fight alongside you, because in the story of Frozen he only takes Elsa's orders. They show us the party member team up limit for Sora and Marshmallow and it's called Avalanche Breath. Your commands during this are the finish, ice rage, jump, and cancel. What we see on the screen must be ice rage. Also, very good sign to see that this giant boss has been staggering to most of Sora's attacks. Also, real quick in the back, you see these little baby wolves creeping around. Looks like this boss is one of those that likes to bring out little enemies to annoy us and do his dirty work. And our last scene in this fight is a cinematic, probably a situation command or something that comes up during his desperation move. Sora and Marshmallow team up to stop this giant dark spirit bomb thing from crashing over the whole world. Are we DBZ now, boys? Say your prayers! Alright, now we're in the final cutscenes of the trailer where everything really is gonna pop off. Ansem is talking to Zigbar in Twilight Town, talking about destroying someone if they waver from the path. And then Zigbar is concerned doing that would make them need a new vessel. The obvious assumption here would be to think that they are talking about one of their own 13 darknesses that they don't fully trust at the moment, and that could be very true. After thinking about this for a little while, I think another possibility is they're talking about Sora. For one, look at the context. They're in Twilight Town, and this is Ansem reporting to Zigbar. In Twilight Town, the organization member's purpose has been tempting Sora into bringing Roxas back. I believe the organization and Sora share a common goal of bringing Roxas back, but for different reasons. The organization may want to make him their 13th, as Xemnas has said in the past he was a very worthy candidate. So they are laying out a path for Sora to bring back Roxas, but if Sora starts going another way, they'll destroy him. They technically don't need him for the Seven Lights Clash, as Xehanort's backup plan is to attack the Seven Pure Hearts and clash that way instead. I think this could be plausible, and the only thing that kinda clashes with it is Larkseen confidently saying they have 13 darknesses. Even Sora and the gang are surprised by that. Could be a bluff, but another point on that is coming up. We also got a nice shot of Sora talking to the Twilight Town trio. I'm sure they're still in Twilight Town, but I'm not exactly sure where this is. It may be a new area. My first thought was from inside of the mansion because of the tile floor, but eh, I mean they're different enough that that still could be a stretch. In our next scene, we have Vexen, or Evan, whatever, talking to Demix about a plan. Okay, so you see the yellow eyes, of course. These two may be part of the new organization. But with all this, it makes way too many members for a new organization. You could think that Xehanort just has backups, but I do think that because of Vexen saying this whole plan was his idea, is that these two are following some kind of plan set by Ansem the Wise to infiltrate the organization. Evan was loyal to Ansem back when he was a person, not Demix though. We've seen similar-ish ideas of this in the past in the series. Ansem has a similar eye color to Xehanort, so he could have put part of his own heart in them as an experiment, or Vexen and Demix purposely took a part of Xehanort's heart but are working as sort of a double agent for Ansem. Obviously Xehanort is not dumb enough to not keep track of who he's keeping for his vessels, so it might have to be the second one. Remember, we have seen that the Nording process isn't always full on right away, like we're seeing with Larkseen, Zigbar, and Luxord. So it's possible to keep your old mind while also bearing a piece of Xehanort's heart. That makes this theory plausible. The two of them talking in what looks like Radiant Garden just strengthens this theory for me. Them tricking Xehanort and becoming fake Norts could also be a reason why Larkseen insists that they have 13 when Ansem and Zigbar are potentially worried about Sora not following their plan to bring back Roxas for a vessel. This is all very very confusing, but it all kinda sorta comes together. Remember, these are just theories, and we have no way of verifying it right now. In our next scene, we're back in the Big Hero 6 world as we see from Sora's goggles and find out that this Riku is the organization member for the world. Okay, hold up. Stay with me here. <clears throat> I don't believe this Riku and the Riku that Riku is talking to on Destiny Islands are the same Riku. You get that? 
The one from the beach doesn't have the Xehanort eyes or a coat, and this one does. I think that this is most likely Data Riku, and that Xehanort somehow got his hands on him because of the recoded references in the Big Hero 6 world. Data Riku was the embodiment of the journal, so Jiminy, this is all your fault. So back to the beach Riku, I think that if this is not a revived Riku replica, this is Riku talking to the physical embodiment of his darkness, his dark side. It was hinted in Dream Drop Distance that he still has to face his dark side, although that one was wearing a hood, and earlier in this trailer, Riku was telling Mickey about how he's finally able to face the darkness now. That scene from Destiny Islands is looking more like a symbolic scene of him facing that darkness. Mickey pointed out that the strength to protect what matters is a reason why he can face the darkness, and on the beach here is the same area where he first said that line to Terra. I think it all makes sense. So this Riku here again looks like Data Riku, who has been caught and exploited by Xehanort. The only thing that I can think of that makes him seem not like Data Riku is that he uses that line on Sora about one-upping each other. Data Riku is very much his own character who takes on the appearance of Riku, so I don't think he would be saying such a Riku line to Sora. If they brought Data Riku in the real world here, then that means that the plans we've been seeing in past trailers to bring back Roxas by accessing Data Twilight Town seem to have even more merit. <laughs> Next, we see the Land of Departure. Ventus is asleep and Vanitas says, What am I gonna do with you, brother? Dude, I love this line. In the short trailer, I hated this shot of Vanitas because it reminded me of some very stupid anime memes, but now seeing him sitting over Ventus and wondering what to do made me do a 180, and now I think it's my favorite line in the whole trailer. Wow, context really is everything. Since Ventus is sleeping, it implies that this is taking place in the present time, and Vanitas has found Ventus and restored Castle Oblivion back to Land of Departure. One would think you need the Master Keeper to do that, and the last person we saw with that was Sora, so how did he get here? Unknown. In the next scene, we see Aqua in the Realm of Darkness again. Wow, she's standing on water. And she says there's nothing left in her heart but misery and despair. She still has Mickey's stolen Keyblade, but now we get to see more of her design. What's notable is her hands are red at the fingertips, and the darkness on her isn't just part of her outfit, it's on her actual skin. <coughs> it's on her actual skin, like she's deteriorating into some dark thing. Some people theorize that she could be turning into a Darkling from Kingdom Hearts Key. I don't entirely believe that though due to other stuff in this trailer. But it is worth noting that there is a Darkling holding a Wayfinder star on the box art of Kingdom Hearts 3. We haven't really been shown the Darkling transformation process to be a slow one in Kingdom Hearts Key though, so this would be a little weird if it was true. I also don't believe in it because of her hair change. There's not much reason for that to happen if she was in the process of changing into something like a Darkling. I still lean towards the Xehanort influence. Speaking of Xehanorts, let's check out the last scene in the short trailer. There's one shot of Vanitas and Xemnas in the Keyblade graveyard, and Vanitas says only when your hopes have been broken by battle upon battle can the key, most likely the Keyblade, to Kingdom Hearts be claimed. You know what's kind of strange about that? What Vanitas describes here, their hopes being crushed battle by battle, kind of describes the chess game between Xehanort and Ericus. At the end, Xehanort calls checkmate and Ericus seems hopeless. Vanitas says that when things look like this, the key to Kingdom Hearts can be claimed. And then Ericus moves to pick up the Sora piece, implying that Sora's about to do some OP stuff. Well, what if Vanitas is right? And after all this, the key to Kingdom Hearts is claimed in this moment, but it's claimed by Sora, and then Sora defeats all of them with his Keyblade. You never know, there's more to light than meets the eye. You might be surprised. <laughs> now we see Master Xehanort's reveal. His new voice actor is heard too, and it sounds spot on. He says a line about Keyblade wielders writing their destiny and to start the Keyblade War. And it sounds very similar to something he was spouting to Terra, Ventus, and Aqua in Birth by Sleep. When he emerges from the fog, his model is so good, like it looks just like the CGI from the Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix secret ending. Alright, let's talk about the quick flashes of shocking scenes. First, we have Aqua attempting to attack the Guardian in the Realm of Darkness. Ansem is also here, so this could be where they came to put Xehanort's heart inside of her. More proof that she's probably a Xehanort. She tries to attack him with no Keyblade, again, 
Like I said earlier, that reinforces the idea I told you about her Keyblade being transferred over with the World of Destiny Islands to the Realm of Light. For some reason, she can't summon it back to the Realm of Darkness. It looks like she tries to kick the Guardian, but then she realizes she has no Keyblade, so she's like, oh, never mind, actually, I gotta go. But then the Guardian is like, where are you going? I remember back in the Kingdom Hearts 0.2 trailer when she was grabbed by the Dark Hands, I said I believe this is the Guardian's hands. It was not revealed what it was in the game, but I still think that's true. We see Kyrie using Lee's own catchphrase against him. Got it memorized. Real cute. Demix comes out of a corridor of darkness while holding someone in white. It's too hard to see his eyes and what color they are. He's in front of Ienzo, which is more evidence that makes me think they're all in on some Ansem the Wise Master plan. The person he's carrying could be wrapped in a blanket, but I think it's actually the white lab coat that Ansem's men wore. Which member of the crew it is, I have no idea. And next we see Ienzo getting consoled by Ansem the Wise, wearing a black coat just like he was in the Realm of Darkness. Remember, they had a close relationship where Ansem the Wise was basically raising him as his own child. This is proof that Ansem the Wise actually escaped from the Realm of Darkness, and judging by his body language, it seems like he escaped safely and is here to help. In Twilight Town, we see Aiza approaching Lee. Now, why is this happening? I don't know, but my interest is really piqued. Aiza is a Xehanort by now, but I don't see how these two former best friends can have a peaceful reunion. Oh my god, this seems like it's getting emotional. And if this isn't some kind of flashback, why does Lee still not have a new outfit? Is this man really gonna be in an organization coat for the whole game? Next we have a shot of Terra Xehanort. It's very close up, but it looks like he's in the Keyblade graveyard based on the colors in the background. Remember, in the chess game, Xehanort put Terra out there for the checkmate, so this could be a scene that has to do with that. This next scene is very perplexing. Venetus is in Land of Departure, but now we see he has Aqua 2 in addition to Ventus. It's really hard to say when this takes place in the story if it's not a flashback. Some people say he's pulling a Ventus on her and splitting her in two so she has light and dark. I think the dark thing was more of a Xehanort thing, so I doubt it a bit. But I wouldn't be surprised if Xehanort had influence over her temporarily in the Realm of Darkness and they only wanted to use her to find Ventus instead of being an actual vessel, and later she returns back to her normal blue hair and outfit. There's also a typical Kingdom Hearts barrier in the background, but this one is cracked. Is this scene taking place right after an intense fight? There's this really weird glow coming from the middle chair in the background. This could have been where Ventus was just sitting in the last scene. What happened to him? It's worth noting that the pose Vanitas is doing here is the exact pose he did in Birth by Sleep when he was ordered to kill Aqua. So in this scene, he might be just about to kill her again, thinking this is something he owes her from a long time ago. That makes sense to me. Wow, we might just be looking at a murder scene right now. The biggest mysteries about these Land of Departure scenes are why is Vanitas not wearing a coat and how did he restore the world without the Master Keeper? In our next cut, Sora is grabbing Aqua's hand from underwater, but this time it's in his Kingdom Hearts 3 outfit. That is something very similar to what we've seen in the 0.2 intro, but instead of passing this off as symbolic, now I actually have to think about it. Well, there is water, so this could be Destiny Islands, and Sora was wondering where the Master Keeper would guide him, so maybe it guided him here to whatever this is to save Aqua. And then we have a very, very cool shot of Sora about to dive into Ventus' heart. This will probably be the point in the game where you wake him up. Riku in Dream Drop Distance was given this power to wake up Sora only after becoming a Keyblade Master. So Sora using this to awaken Ventus means he is also a Keyblade Master. And he honestly may become one very early in the game after Olympus when he's named a true hero, and that's what this new look represents. Sora and Kairi are sitting on Destiny Islands, and this scene could be, dare I say it, romantic. I think they're overdue for some romance, so that would be cool as long as they don't overdo it. In a new artwork recently revealed drawn by Nomura, Sora is shown holding a Paupu fruit that was bitten, so maybe Kairi and Sora will share a Paupu fruit in the scene. A concept that's been around since the Kingdom Hearts 1 days. I sure hope you guys won that race in Kingdom Hearts 1. Deal? 
The winner gets to share a pow poo with Kyrie. Oh, wait a minute! Lee is crying in what looks to be that same Kyrie reveal scene. There's no telling what it could be for, but my best wild guess is that while hanging out and talking to Kairi under the sunset, something inside of him was able to remember Xion because of her. Never forget. That's the truth. He feels all the grief from before. And in our final scene, we see Roxas taking off his hood, holding the Oblivion in one hand, and if you looked very carefully, he's holding the Oathkeeper in the other. I think this is most likely a shot of Data Roxas in Data Twilight Town. Ansem the Wise could have analyzed and saved Data on this form of him after Riku fought him. It's very silly, but there's been some talk of the window here looking like an Agrabah window, but I think the background overall looks very similar to an area of Twilight Town, so I'm rolling with the whole Data Twilight Town thing. And can I just say, ending the trailer with him putting his hood down like that is just so cool! Very good job, Square. Oh. My. God. There's an end. Guys! Guys! Look! There's an end! There's an end to this trailer! I feel like I've talked forever in this trailer analysis. But hey, we gotta cover everything because that's what I do best. Thank you so much for watching this trailer analysis. I hope you enjoyed all the videos I've been uploading recently for Kingdom Hearts 3. I worked very hard on each and every one of them. By the way, since I was able to get this trailer analysis out so fast, TGS 2018 is still going on and there's still more Kingdom Hearts news to come. There's actually a live stream, I believe, tonight at like 11.50 p.m. Eastern, and all of the TGS live streams, I'm gonna try and stream them on my Twitch channel live, just restream them and you can watch it with me with my reaction and stuff. So if you want to do that with me, go follow my Twitch. I'll put a link in the description below. You just watched me talk about Kingdom Hearts for 45 minutes. So like, what are you doing not already following me on Twitch? I'd love to have you guys join me for any more news that comes from TGS. This is easily the best trailer for the game. This is the first trailer in a long time where I already knew it was the best before having to take a deeper look and analyze. It was just that good on surface level. I love the dialogue, especially in this trailer, it feels like the best dialogue in the whole series. January 29th is closer than ever, but somehow feels farther than ever. I can't wait to play this game, and this trailer really reminded me of why Kingdom Hearts is my favorite series. Well guys, I've been Sir Alam one and as always, thank you for watching.